Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on this episode of Wandering DMs, we're going to be talking about food. Uh, what should you prepare for your game? How should you prepare it? Who should you enjoy it with? On this episode of Wandering DMs. So, uh, Dan is uh, up visiting me for the weekend, and we thought, what could we do that maybe takes uh, makes use of the fact that we're both here in the same space? And... Specifically in Paul's kitchen. Yeah, so uh, right. why not? Let's uh, let's talk about food. Let's do games. this. Yeah. So, on this episode of Wandering DMs, uh, Paul, we are going to be making uh, our famous uh, Wandering DMs white gold cookies. Mm, delicious. Over the course of the show. Yes, I hope so. Um, so, for this uh, recipe today, uh, I got some brown sugar, got some white sugar, uh, some flour here. Uh, I got an egg. Uh, have some butter here that's been softening for the for the past hour or so here in the bowl. Uh, sometimes I microwave that before I use this. Uh, I got vanilla, baking powder, salt, uh, white chocolate chips. That's an important part, uh, and also some cranberries here that we'll be putting in. Nice. We'll be describing so how we're going to use this as we go forward. Uh, the uh, got some uh, baking sheets that have been uh, pre uh, 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 buttered up. And the oven has been preheated to 350 degrees. Excellent. Yeah. Let's, let's get started. Great. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I got the butter here and I'm going to put in, I'm going to make him kind of like a half serving, kind of a small serving. This will make around 20 cookies. Uh, if you want to make more, of course, like double the ingredients as I do this. First thing I'm going to do, I have one stick of butter. I'm going to put in half a cup of white sugar and half a cup of brown sugar and kind of mix that stuff up as the first step. Great. So, um, uh, we already have a comment here on the, on the, uh, in our chat uh, oh, uh, on your lovely apron. Would you like to tell our uh, guests about uh, where this apron well, comes from? Thank you for asking, actually. Yeah. So, so, we wanted a, a D&D themed uh, apron. Um, and so, this apron represents the fact that I probably just had to... Uh, 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 d defeat 15 bugbears and a dragon <laughs> before getting all the supplies, such as the white gold and the cranberries and so forth. This apron was actually designed, uh, Paul, by Brooklyn fine artist Isabel Garbani, Excellent. who we have had on the show in the past, but will probably not ever appear on the show again after she dissed uh, Dave Trampier's art on the Art in D and D show. So this is <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ms. Garbani, uh, for this, and uh, we 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 enjoyed having you the one time that we did. <laughs> Half a, half a cup of white sugar is what's so, going here. So let's Thank talk a little much. bit as you do this about um, how uh, you incorporate food into games. Um, and, and there's a couple different ways we can talk about this, but um, perhaps we can just start with like real like, do you, do you have food at the table while you're gaming? Um, how much of a, of, of gaming, how much of a part of gaming is food for you? Well, that's really interesting. So, I mean, a lot of people, like, have at least snacks at the table. Yeah. And as we were talking to some friends the other day, like, I, I might be in the minority of usually not having that at the table. Um, so, I have a friend uh, who usually hosts our game. His name is Max. I don't know if you know who that is, Paul. Um, uh, I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, he hosts the games, and he usually gets pizza for all of us beforehand. Nice. And then sometimes we might have, like, uh, we might possibly have cookies or... or, or alcohol the table that's usually about yeah. as much as yeah. we usually pizza have. Pizza is certainly very uh, yeah. very traditional right. uh, gaming fair. Right. Um, and I know when we did our July uh, game uh, over the course of a whole weekend, right, right. we had to take breaks, uh, you know, to go and eat food or whatnot. Right. Generally we did that off stream, right, so that was right. our excuse to stop streaming for a little while right. and go, go feed ourselves and... Uh, um, my my own uh, Sunday evening game. Usually uh, after the show, I'm I'm off to go play Fifth Edition D and D with my my regular group, um, and that always includes dinner. Actually, so we uh, we meet at like from five to nine. We play, okay, and usually um, around six o'clock. Uh, so we, we when we show up, we make an, an order from right. a, from a local delivery place. Right, and around six o'clock it shows up, and so we break the game. So okay. we, we oh, really? played for oh. maybe an hour, half an hour to an hour. Oh, really? Then we take a break and we eat our food and we didn't chat. Um, right. Sometimes about the game, sometimes about politics or sports or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, so we have a little, just a quick little downtime, a little break there in the middle. Uh, I think a lot of, I think a lot of, that's, I hadn't heard that before. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, they have a regular get together and maybe they'll have a regular meal right before it. Um, I know that when I was, um, uh, actually my first gaming job actually, which is uh, Papyrus Racing in Boston, uh, we had a regular um, Warcraft game, <laughs> and we would go across uh, at night, we'd go across the street to the, uh, the old country buffet, um, and then come back and we play Warcraft. And so we would we would march across the street and we would all yell out, first we feast, then we war, <laughs> every time we do that. So I think a That's number great. of groups do that, but having the break in the middle is really interesting. So let me just put in the next the next thing here. Uh, so now I'm putting in one egg and I'm going to put in one teaspoon of vanilla and mix all that up in there. Excellent. Really Excellent. well. Excellent. Um, Nailed it. 
you know, so um, we have a um, annual uh, convention that we go to that's uh, just a group of friends called yep. Helgacon that yep. happens in April. Fantastic. And, um, you know, there was sort of a... Now that, that involves a lot of food as well, right? So, in fact, that's like yeah. the one part of the organization of that convention. I actually have another friend who took that over and organized right. the food. Right, right, right. Um, but basically, we I collect money from everyone who comes to pay for the rental of the house, but also sufficient money to buy all the food for the whole weekend. Right. And we do a sign-up over the weekend of, of different volunteers right. signing up to make this meal or that meal. Right. Um, and the funny thing is, the way that usually ends is on Sunday, we have one last game Sunday morning from like 10 to 2 and yeah. then everyone bails and so we have this big sort of rolling Sunday brunch where uh, all the food that didn't get eaten over the course of the weekend is put out <laughs> in the kitchen and whatever's left uh, please eat right, right. so oftentimes uh, you'll be sitting there playing at a, at a table and somebody will notice oh my gosh there's all this food over here let me bring some to the gaming table yeah yeah good point point. Um, and if you remember we had a game that featured battle cheese Yes. Can you remember yes, that? I do. I Remind me. Um, so I believe we were, I think you were DMing, and, um, you know, we were playing a fairly intense old school D&D game, and somebody just had, you know, just blocks of cheese left over from, from some previous meal, brought it over, uh, and uh, presented battle cheese so that we could, uh, you know, sustain ourselves throughout the combat. <laughs> Um, and that became a rallying cry, I think, for that group. Battle cheese! Was I actually DMing for that? I thought you were DMing. I don't, I don't remember, remember that. I get, what do you mean when I'm DMing? I don't have any real cognizance. <laughs> my, my awareness of outside the game is not there oh, so well. Funny. Interesting. That's great. That's great. Um, and well, some people do it more, really more elaborately. Like, I've heard people, like, they have a regular, like, you know, cooking session, a whole, you know, multi-course meal before the, before the game. Yeah, uh, you know, friend, amazing. Uh, one of uh, friends of the show, um, Brenda Flynn, was telling yeah. us about how her, it was actually a whole ritual of preparing yeah. the food together. Right. The whole group would come together, right. make a meal together, right. and then sit down to game. Right, right. Which um, is great. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? It's a very social activity, yeah. gaming, and, yeah. and so incorporating a meal into that. Yeah, it's really natural. among the two most social things you can do. Is you, yeah. You're getting together with friends yeah. it's, you know it's 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 a re, you know recuperation recovery time for everybody and it really actually makes a whole lot of sense that 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 social together time is actually very similar so yeah. um disinvited artist isabel garvani would like uh -huh, to know uh -huh. if you're going oh. to actually shape the cookies into something like a dragon or a troll or something D, &D themed for there us. was some consideration to possibly putting them in the shape of d20s actually mm -hmm. but in order to in order to pull that off i felt like icing would be necessary so that might possibly be a really good <laughs> suggestion for a future episode of wandering dm's cooking shows in paul's kitchen uh but that wasn't the plan for today okay. it's going to be okay. it's going to be kind of it's going to be it's going to be lumpy. That's great. It's going to be a little lumpy. So what I'm putting in right now is I'm putting in half a teaspoon of baking powder right here. Uh, and I'm also putting in, I guess, a quarter teaspoon of salt. Just a little bit of salt there. Great. Great. Mixing all that in. Uh, I'm reminded that when we go uh, to Total Con, um, they have, you know, it's mostly RPGs at Total Con. It happens in February in Marlboro. Um, and we've, we've cast last year from there live at the convention, and we probably will again. They have a, a, a small exhibit hall with maybe half a dozen or or, or maybe eight or ten uh, yeah, different yeah. different booths of where you can buy various game related yeah. stuff. And one booth that shows up every year is these uh, um, this lovely company that makes um, cupcakes. Oh, really? Right, and and very much D and D. Oh, right, cupcakes. right, 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 um, right. Yeah, I, I, I right. wish I knew their name. Right, right. Uh, I'd give them the plug, but. Right. Uh, uh, it's really become a very strong tradition of that convention is that right. you see these cupcakes showing right. up. And I think they do clever things where they like uh, they'll they'll sell you a roll of a D twenty for a random chance of a new of a, of a free cupcake. <laughs> oh really? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah so really it's, nice. it's great stuff. They're really beautiful, really nice. gorgeous cupcakes and quite delicious and that's a lot of fun. Um, okay, so aside from just the mechanics of eating at the table, what about actually incorporating food into your game itself? Well, obviously, that's something that has, you know, at the at the outset, right, D&D &D initially was, you know, war game based uh, and, you know, resource management based. So obviously, at the outset, uh, among, in the very short list of equipment in original D&D, &D, you had rations. You had two types of rations, your standard rations, your your, um, your iron rations, supposedly. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, at this point, I'm going to be putting... Oh, oh, yeah, let's so now I'm putting... So time. I have this kind of... So and I have this mixture of uh, sugar and butter and vanilla mm -hmm. and baking powder and things like that kind of mixed up pretty well. Now I'm putting in quite a bit of flour here. So there's going to be a cup and a half of flour. And I will mix all that up. So at the outset, uh, you know, the, the resource management of, um, uh, you know, coming out of the outdoor survival game, 
of what does it take to, I guess I'll stir this up and put some more in, um, of what does it take to survive in the wilderness as far as uh, rations and water and being lost uh, was a really core part of the game. When I run games now, that tends to surprise new players the first time. Mm -hmm. So with my current play group, the first time they went in the wilderness, um, only one uh, kind of slightly more expert player knew to get rations. And they were out for about a week. And then I was like, and, you know, do you can please consume your rations? And four out of five players were like, I was supposed to do what now? Um, and they actually rapidly started starving to death. <laughs> and then they got lost, right? And then they're in pretty bad shape. Um, and after that, so they were, they actually were on the cusp of starving to death in their first wilderness adventure. Mm -hmm. And after that, they, they got the message. And after that, they've been really, really, um, uh, uh, on the ball about making sure that they have rations before That's they funny. go in the wilderness. Now, have you ever as a DM killed a player through starvation? I don't think so, but I mean, I was, I mean, I'm willing to, I'm happy to, right? <laughs> and there was the game yeah. that, that you were playing in where the the, the party got tra teleported, you know, basically into an arid plain right. area where you right. didn't have water. And the qu the question right there was, you'd left all your water behind with the, with the horses and the whole party was about to, I was yeah. about to TPK the whole party yeah. based on ha not uh, having any water. Fortunately, we had a very, very... Clever player, a friend of ours, Dave, uh, who was playing a, a reasonably high-level magic user, right. and realized that he could create a wall of ice. Uh, so conjured a wall of ice so that we could then gather the melting water off yeah. of the uh, the wall of ice, yeah. uh, which is great. Which I mean, again had made me think: is that is that is it, you know, and so, you know, and some people nowadays would say like, if the spell doesn't say it, right? The spell doesn't explicitly say you can get drinkable water off this, and the spell doesn't permit this. But in old school D and D, it seems reasonable if you have a big block of ice in a hot uh, terrain, it seems like it would melt and you could gather it. So I said yes to that. So don't say I never gave my players <laughs> any rulings in their favor, because I did in that case. But it was very clever. You'd be hard pressed to say no to that. Got one more half cup of flour going in there. Great. So that's so. Do you feel like in in new school? I mean, you can you can talk about computer games too, right? Yeah. So if you go back to classic computer games that were inspired by D and D, like Rogue or NetHack or even Gauntlet or something like that, like the fact that you're you're currently actually losing, you know, you're on the cusp of losing your endurance and your health unless you're regularly eating was a major part of all those games. Or even like Dark Tower, yeah. right? So Dark Tower, the main thing you were balancing is you were trying to build a force of mercenaries to attack the tower, but the more mercenaries you have, the more rations you're consuming. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes it was advantageous to have a small number to move rapidly, and sometimes you needed a lot for a fight, yeah. but then you're, ba you're counterbalancing this with how many rations you can carry. I mean, it's certainly the game itself has a lot of mechanics built in for managing this, right? Yeah. You have a lot of spells, like yeah. create food and water. Right, purify um, food and water. You know, you have uh, abilities, like oftentimes right. a ranger will have an ability that allows them to forage. Right. right? That's certainly right. Yep, a, yep, a yep. labyrinth forge staple. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Yeah, so, so I feel I like... I agree. Um, yeah, it was a big part, of the, big part of the game, for sure. I agree. Um, I saw, I mean, I saw recently there was an argument on, on Stack Exchange RPG, but... Uh, purify food and water, right? It's the first level cleric spell. It's always been in the game. Does that let you purify salt water to be drinkable? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Right. So yeah, it's purifying well, the title. Right, right, right. right. And I mean, I mean, the description says if something's poison or toxic, it cleans that up so that it's safe. It's safe to, it seems, to eat or drink. It seems to me pretty reasonable that it might desalinate salt water. A whole lot of people said no. It's oh, not poison. Is it poison? No. no. Salt is not poison. You need that in your body, as a matter of fact. Right? So no. Yeah. yeah. Purify food and water will not turn salt water to fresh. Weird. I mean, I don't actually have an opinion. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. That, anyway, that was, those were the two sides. Interesting. Those were the two Interesting. sides. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, Ash mentions to us in the chat um, that he plays with a group that has a lot of different dietary restrictions. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, and so often uh, encourages everyone to bring a little something, right? So Great. everybody brings Great. something. It comes with kind of a potluck, sounds Great. like kind of an experience. So I, I totally sympathize with that. Personally, I'm a vegetarian. Yeah. Um, so that is something I also often have to look out for. Um, and that's actually an excellent bridge to uh, what, what I really want to get into is like actually using food as a prop in oh, a game. Oh, interesting. So, Hold um, that thought. Yeah, sure. So, so now I'm putting, now I've got the batter sort of made up. You could make cookies out of this. Uh, I'm going to put in the white chocolate chips that represent the gold that you that you achieve at the end of your adventure. The white gold mm. uh, being poured into the batter here. And I'll mix that up. 
So yeah, how have you? I guess I haven't used food directly in yeah. the game as like a feature a lot. So the first time I encountered this was at a Gen Con many years ago. I was playing a Cthulhu right. game, um, and the Cthulhu game centered around we were an Arctic expedition. Um, I think it's based on a famous Arctic expedition that got where a bunch of ships got caught in the ice. Right, so they were stuck there in the ice for an extended period of time, oh. and so we were dealing with deprivation. You know, food, they one of the historic problems that this particular expedition had is they had a lot of tinned food, but tinning was new at that time, and yep. so it was actually um, un, unedible, inedible because of uh, uh, the poor tinning process. Now, a little footnote: see, you know, yeah. historically, that's what iron rations actually are, right? So iron. Uh, rations were actually something that came up in World War One, and actually referred to the iron cans oh, interesting. that soldiers circa World War One carried around as like emergency foodstuffs if they got cut off from their huh. normal food supplies. Huh. And I think a lot of us, uh, you know, maybe maybe Gary Gygax might have slightly misinterpreted that as like you know hard bacon, you know, hard uh, small preserved meats, which is what? not exactly what that was. We, I, you, we'll get back to my yeah, story yeah, yeah. in a second. Okay. I'm kind of curious, actually, because okay. this is a question I have to answer at the table yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. Often, the, my players will ask me, what is the difference between standard and iron rations? Yeah. So what in, do you tell them? In Gar okay, so, well, in Gary's mind, it was the difference between like like large items like like bread mm -hmm. uh, and flour versus preserved items like you know bacon or hardtack. Right. Well, how do, you, how do you adjudicate that mechanically, though? Right. Like, I think a lot of people, so, so, but, but for me, yeah. I actually do sit from, in my table, like actually if you look at my equipment list, I actually strike it out of the equipment oh, list, as a matter of fact, but secretly, don't tell any players and don't let them hear this, secretly there are some dwarven enclaves that actually do have tin can technology and can batch <laughs> up stuff in iron cans. Only the dwarves know how to do this. And then it uh, it is lighter and it lasts for a whole year instead of like just a couple weeks. Interesting. So usually like with my players, I say at the start of a session, strike out all the rations that you had from last time. They're all gone. You have to rebuy it every time we sit at the, t the table. So generally but you if you had rations, iron rations, they would, they would last. Normal rations you allow to last some number of weeks? Yeah, like like, yeah, probably like two weeks. Okay, interesting. Yeah. interesting. Yeah. So the way I've always ruled it, it was a little different. I, I Let me just put, the, sorry. So, so now I'm going to put in the cranberries. And Paul, the cranberries represent the one or two hundred... Uh, 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 hearts or giblets of kobolds or goblins that you had to carve through in order to get all this wonderful foodstuffs <laughs> here. So in go the, the 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 hearts and the entrails of the various beings you had to destroy. Uh, so the way I've ruled it is more in line with uh, the Gygax interpretation that there are different kinds of food. Right. Um, and this is this is purely stuff I've made up because no book has told me to do this. Right. right. I just I had to like I'm looking at at. Um, you know, mostly BX type stuff where you're buying rations by the week, right? That's right. usually a week of standard, a week of yep, iron. Yep. Iron costs more. No explanation of what that means. True, true. Um, so uh, what I've ended up ruling is that uh, standard rations are sort of normal foodstuffs, normal yep. um, perishable foodstuffs, which I say won't last more than one week. Okay. One week okay. out in the yep. open. I mean, yep, there's yep. no refrigeration, right? That, yep, this yep. stuff's going to go bad. Yep. So it's, in fact useless to buy more than one week of standard rations. Oh, interesting. Because oh. they will go bad. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, and then iron rations I allow to last up to four weeks. Okay. I think that's what it's, I think that is what it is in that version of the book. I think Frank Metzer's, Frank Menzer's oh, book says that, is that standard rations last one week and iron rations last either up Either I've four, somehow I managed to completely yeah. internalize Menzer's ruling yeah, yeah. or I think, just happily came up with the exact same numbers. I think so. that's probably what, what the situation that's was. That's interesting. Yeah. I think he had one week and one month and I think I prefer, I, I permit... Uh, one month and one year. So that's a very life. healthy sized cookie you're making there. Okay. How, how, okay. Uh, really? Okay. Yeah, they're a little different from when I when I make cookies. Okay. So how how big are these cookies going to be when you're done? Uh, well, uh, great question, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, pretty big. Yeah. Uh, pretty big. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, we'll see. I mean, usually I like, I like a big cookie. I like okay. my cookies. Okay. I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be, uh, I don't, I don't want somebody to bogart my cookies. So yeah, they'll be, they'll be healthy sized. Okay. okay. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be the whole pan, but yeah, they're going to be pretty healthy sized. At least that one is. Yep. So anyway, so if Paul's noticing that I am dolloping out. For me, large cookie sized. I'm a high level guy, so I'm going to take a big cookie onto the pre greased pan, Excellent. Uh, Excellent. whatever size Excellent. you prefer. Yeah. All right. Let me let me get back to my uh, my Cthulhu story. Right. 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 Sorry. Okay. About. Okay. So, uh, um, yeah. So uh, so there was I was playing Cthulhu game and and we're we're in the um, as mentioned in the in the Arctic trapped on these boats. Right. Um, and the DM actually so it was, it was a co DM game. There were two DMs, oh, which is very interesting. I love it. Um, one of them 
was more or less acting as the traditional DM, and the other was more sort of the the, the gopher, the, the let me fill in stuff. Okay, okay. And they did a lot of stuff to really push the setting. So uh, we were in a small private ballroom. Uh, it's August. It's in Milwaukee, and um, actually maybe Indianapolis at that time. And um, they uh, they had closed the doors. And like covered up the any windows into the room or whatnot. So oh, when you okay. came in, oh, this is this is just happenstance, by the way. They were I think they were just trying to block sound. Okay, okay. Uh, but they had this small ballroom privately to themselves. And when you went in, it was noticeably cooler in the room, which was oh, really geez. nice for okay. a game set okay. in the Arctic, right? Now okay. I mean, yeah, still yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. August, so like how much cooler is it really? We're still right, in shorts right, and right, t-shirts, right. but it was noticeably cooler. Um, and they give us uh, each person at their at their spot, in addition to their character sheet, has these giant mittens. So we're wearing these giant mittens to pretend oh, like we're, oh, we're in the okay, Arctic, okay. And, which is, of course, hilarious when okay. you have to roll dice okay. we're wearing these huge, huge mittens. Um, so obviously they were into that, and so the, the, the co-DM had a computer and was adding sound effects, and so there's a lot of elements of trying to push the, the, the scene, uh, of the, the mood, the environment for Great. you. So one of the things that came up is at some point um, my character gets taken aside, ends up in a room, and... Uh, discovers a small piece of meat uh, of questionable origin, right? So, pro- you know, obviously, like, cannibalism overtones here. And the DM actually presents me with a small piece of jerky. Oh, oh, geez. and And, and it was kind of heartbreaking for me because as a vegetarian, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah, say yeah, no yeah, thanks. Yeah, right, right, but right, right. as a role player, right, I was right. like, oh, it would be so much yeah, more interesting yeah, 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 for yeah, my yeah, character yeah. to eat this. Yeah, okay, yep, yep, yep. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think I had the... Uh, wherewithal at the moment to like articulate all that to him because I was yeah, you know yeah, I'm yeah. in the game and I'm playing yeah. and I'm going whoa what is happening this guy's yeah. offering me this weird yeah. s- sketchy piece of meat yeah um, for real yeah for real for yeah. really like he Whack knew, here you go right role playing this this other this right. NPC of ooh look I found this thing right um, so me, unfortunately I I'm think, gonna put the I'm gonna put the cookies in the in the oven right now so this has been uh, preheated to 350 and um, uh, the idea is it ought to be in about 30 minutes we'll see we're gonna check on it. Uh, so, so yeah, so, um, so they offered you, so yeah. did anybody take that in the um, game? Well, unfortunately, it was specifically offered to my character who was alone okay. in this, in this, oh, in this scene. And I think, um, the right thing to do, now that I've had time to, to dwell on it, is I wish I had said, like, just sort of taken a moment to step out of the character and say, listen, in right, real life, right. I'm a vegetarian, but can you just say that my character ate that, please? Okay, oh, you're right, 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 right. right. How about yeah, yeah. You, you eat it. Understood. You DM Understood. eat it for me. I know you're trying to give, give me immersive, and I appreciate right. your efforts in making yep. this immersive for That's me, right. but as a vegetarian, I'm not going right. to eat meat yep. of course. for a role-playing game. Right. 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 <laughs> so I wish I had done that. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you know, do, what, what do you think, the, do you have any idea what the effect would have been if you, if no, you had your character no. had eaten it? No, I didn't. Hmm. I don't know. Became a cannibal, oh. lost some sanity. I don't know. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, never, never got to find out. So have you done props like that? I have, I have, yeah. actually. So I have here a game that I've run, another horror game uh, called uh, Something Stinks in Stilton. Um, I believe that's available on Drive Through RPG. Um, it is by the uh, Melsonian Arts Council. <laughs> um, and I believe it's originally written for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a great, it's a, a great adventure. So it's it's you know it's fantasy set like Lamentation of the Frank, Flame Princess is set in a quasi historic European setting, right? Sort right. of Renaissance or medieval period. Right. Um, and so it actually plays, takes place in Stilton, where they make the cheese. Great. Right. And the cheese features prominently in the game. Yes. Uh, it's its definite plot. I don't want to I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but the the cheese is an important part of the scenario. So when I run this game. I try to bring some Stilton to the table okay. as an okay. actual thing to present on the table. <laughs> so when they arrive at, at the Bell Tavern and they order some food that has some right. some, some cheese on it, right. I, I put out this nice cheese tray, and then I watch the players like a hawk. Because if any of them right. actually eats the cheese, I have to immediately ask for a saving throw. Oh, nice. Um, nice. And it takes them often a little bit to detect that's what's going on. Gotcha. Right, because they're all like, great. oh, cheese, right? The whole, great, the whole great, table's like, great, you know, great. Half, at least half the table is excited great, to have great. some cheese, right? <laughs> <laughs> Delicious, tasty cheese. And so they start eating the cheese, and then I'm like, make a saving throw, make a saving throw. And then, <laughs> then they start realizing what's going great. on. And usually that's at least great. one person goes, oh, I'm not going to eat the cheese. Right, right. 
Um, yeah, I ended up making uh, my own little handouts, which I think are on my blog somewhere. So if you just search my blog for Something Stinks in Stilton, um, I made actual menus for the tavern. So if Great. you show up at the tavern, you can hand out these menus, which is a nice little handout. Great. Um, you know, includes, includes, include, yeah, yeah, please, please do. There's both a, a food menu and a libations menu. Libations is really just for just for effect, right. just to make it feel right. good. Uh, the menu does have a little uh, secret in it, if you can figure it out. You want to read to our audience what's on the menu? Here is the uh, the menu in uh, Paul's uh, Something Stinks in uh, uh, Stilton game. Uh, I get four items here. Cheese board, classic plate of sprint off cheese. Did I read that right? Oh, it should it should say Stilton. I have occasionally gotcha. run this in Warhammer. Right. Uh, so in Warhammer, I translate Stilton gotcha. to become sprint gotcha. off. Uh, crusty bread and seasonal nuts and fruits for one silver piece. Second item, garlic roasted fillet with a brandy sprint off. Again, sauce, roasted potatoes, and root vegetables for five silver pieces. That sounds delicious. Third item, roasted prime rib of beef. Uh, au jus with a sprint off cream, mashed potatoes, and butternut squash. Eight silver pieces. And the last item, steak and ale pie. Slow cooked steak, amber ale, and mushrooms served with mashed potatoes and seasonal greens. Three silver pieces. Hmm. That, sounds, that sounds delicious. I don't see what the secret there is. Uh, the fact is that every single item on the menu includes the cheese. Uh, the only one that doesn't specifically mention it is the gotcha. last one, the steak and ale pie. But of course, being a pie, it's filled with a cheese sauce in addition oh, to all the other brilliant. other uh, Great. items. Brilliant. So yeah, basically, Great. it's totally impossible to order anything that does not okay. have the cheese in okay. it or so on it or some way. Gotcha. The sprint off sauce, the sprint off cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, good. It's kind of like the Monty Python spam schedule. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. You know the um, the uh, so um, actually um, uh, Brooklyn-based fine artist Isabel Garbani, who probably who I don't know maybe she'll be on the show someday, but not, not <laughs> in the near future, um, has recently been watching uh, a show called The Terror on uh, I think on the Hulu service actually, which is uh, kind of like that Cthulhu game, mm. uh, 1800s ship at least season one, 1800s ship trapped in the ice of the Arctic. Yeah. What it are we going to do? Running out of food. It was a real event, so yeah. it was probably right. both based on the same historic yeah. event. Yep, yep, um, yep. Let me stop you for a second, Dan. Yeah. Did you happen to set a timer for the cookies that you put? Uh, the mentally. Yeah, all mentally. Right, all right. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're going to see how good. At, 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 at twelve, twelve, at, at <laughs> one fifty-two, one fifty-two, right, they're right, supposed right, to good, be done. Good, supposedly. Good, good. Yeah. Hopefully the. Hopefully the the. Yeah, we'll see. Usually, I have to, usually I have to check it. Hopefully, we'll hopefully it'll be done at uh, a little bit before the, the end of the show. Actually, we'll be able to eat them. Yeah. Um, so um, sorry, I, I threw you. I threw you. You were talking about the, the show, The Terror. Yeah. So anyway, so 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 uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, that's the kind of like raw, concrete, real world detail that I mean, we're all familiar with food. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're all familiar with what it's like to be hungry. So a scenario like that, I feel, where the food is running out seems to be very tangible and, as usual, usually turns my games into horror movies, um, intentionally or unintentionally. Great. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so that seems so like a that, that seems like a detail that isn't usually in in. Go ahead. I was gonna say, have you ever used or seen used food as a prop in in an actual game? You know, I actually haven't. I don't hmm. think I have. Unless I, unless my memory is bad, I don't think I personally have. It's that's not something I would honestly think of. Um, you know, I've used other types of props, but I actually I haven't used. I haven't you know, used I'm food. I'm reminded actually now that um, there's another Cthulhu game I've run in right. set in the uh, 80s right. that uh, has a. Um, a, a drug is a, is one is a major part of the plot line. Right. And so to, to represent the drug in the game, I actually take a couple of uh, Smarties, which are just, you know, all, oh, almost yep. look like okay. pills, okay. right? Okay. Almost yep. look like okay. pills, Smarties. Okay. And you take a couple of those and you put them in a clear plastic baggie and it sure as heck looks like drugs. Brilliant. Right, so Brilliant. I hand those out to the players as a representation of the drugs. <laughs> um, but again, I did exactly to one of my players right. what was done to me, where I had a player who uh, couldn't have sugar and okay. so wanted to like okay. partake in the in the in right. the drug, but I was like, I, I can't right. eat sugar. And I was like, okay. that's fine. Let's we'll just pretend. Great. Yeah, you know, that's the right Give choice. me back the drugs and yep. pretend your character ate them, yep. and we'll we'll forget about Good it. Call. Good call. Um, Good call. So here's another case that I could think Good of call. where I used. Now another thing that happens is like you know sometimes people bring like a meal to the table. Like I've seen um, on Critical Role. I guess I've seen them actually eating during the show. Yeah. And I think on your uh, Ten Dead Rats. 
streaming show last Thursday. There were some players in yeah, the we, table. Is that acceptable? I mean, me, I might say, get that out of there. Get that. <laughs> I don't know. That's a completely b- complete breach of etiquette. I mean, it's, it's not something it, we're doing. It's together. something we try to avoid, and we did discuss right. it on the okay. stream. Like, okay. like, let's let's let's. We tried to time the okay. stream in such a time okay. that wouldn't okay. interfere with people's meal time. But you know, things happen. Mm-hmm. Life happens. Things get in the way. Yeah. And, Someone comes yeah. running in and says, "Gosh, I haven't had a chance to eat. Okay. I don't want I don't want to starve you for hours while we play the game. Okay. Right? That seems Might pretty interesting. Cruel. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm hearing no in-game punishment. No, no, I, you know, try to try to. I don't know. It seems like eat. a lost opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I feel a little bit more okay with it because I, like you said, I've seen it on right. other streams like Critical Role. Right. I've seen some of, some right. of the players occasionally eat. Again, I think they are also trying to not do it regularly, right? It's right. not. Right. It's a little distracting. Let's be honest. For, True. For yeah. show, yeah. but. Uh, but that show's four hours, and your show's only two hours. Your show is like a breeze, and if anybody had a limited amount of time, I think that your show would be an excellent option to like fill up their their entertainment quotient or watch over dinner i mean it's a perfect thing to watch while they're eating dinner yeah, actually yeah, i would yeah. recommend that it's a lot it's a much snappier snappier show than that critical role thing <laughs> well thank you very much yeah. uh, so, so one thing i saw in stack exchange yeah. uh, uh, is, um you know talking fifth edition games right so what i what in what in older school games would be the decanter of endless water, right? Mm-hmm. So nowadays the item is the alchemist jug. I was told, yep. right? Yep. That's what it's called. Um, and so it, it's it's a magic item that can produce a number of different substances, like some vinegar or something yeah, else. Yeah, water, Humorous. oil, gotcha. wine, gotcha. a lot of fairly normal things, and then the one very humorous item right. of uh, two gallons of of mayonnaise two gallons of mayonnaise right mm. um so i think somewhere else in the rules it's, you need you need two gallons of food per day or two pounds maybe no. it's two pounds of mayonnaise oh, i'm pretty sure i think it's a liquid measure but okay so i so however it is i think that the, the measurement of the mayonnaise exactly measure exactly matches the daily food intake requirement in fifth edition D. so question does the question came up does mayonnaise count as food like if you have an alchemist jug right so does mayonnaise count as a food product mm. and if so so apparently there's a lot of players out there that want to get an alchemist jug in fifth edition and say my character just eats mayonnaise every single day day after day two gallons i guess apparently two gallons of mayonnaise um does that satisfy your food uh your food ration in fifth edition that that sounds like uh that sounds like a rough uh (laughs) a rough lifestyle (laughs) so you you, you know you dm fifth edition game so yes or no i come to the game i've got my alchemist jug i just want to i just want to eat mayonnaise i would i would probably allow it to extend the duration by which you don't starve for a short period of time but eventually malnutrition i think is going to kick in because mayonnaise is not providing all the uh, important nutrients that a body needs counter argument that's not written in the rules it doesn't say any particular nutrient content you know if i had a fifth edition it says just food and i'm consuming it i can digest it uh, it, it counts as food. So according to the according to the letter of the rules, I should be able to, to exist indefinitely on my mayonnaise. Um, if I had a nickel for everything that wasn't in the rules that I had to make up on the fly, uh, I wouldn't be doing this show. <laughs> I'd be living it up to somewhere, Are you sure? somewhere tropical. Are you sure you still wouldn't be doing the show? No, you're right. <laughs> it yeah. would have way better production values than I <laughs> <laughs> well put, well put. So the other thing, so right, so the other thing, did did I say this on the show? Did I did I do the purify food and water? Did I get that on the show? Was that pre-show? Um, yeah, yeah, we talked about that. Did about, we? Okay, about salt and, and all right, okay, okay, sorry, okay. So that was the early okay. ver- that was the so early edition version. I've, I've heard an anecdote. Uh, I've heard an anecdote that's pretty amusing about that. Um, uh, uh, the alchemist jug, uh, which is that the designers when they were creating that magic item. Um, they made, they sat down and did a little brainstorming session where they listed out as many different things that they could think of that it might produce okay. and then tried to whittle that list down to what you see presented in the, in the, um, player's handbook. Or, or That's going to be DM's Guide, probably. That's going to be DM's Guide, right. Okay. Anyway, uh, so they had this huge list and as I think, I'm sure that you and I both experienced, you get some designers in a room together brainstorming right. for a couple hours and, uh, <laughs> some really ridiculous things come out. Right. Um, and so when they whittled down the list, they got rid of all the, like, truly ridiculous or offensive or whatever uh, <laughs> liquids that could come out of an alchemist jug. Um, but the mayonnaise was the one thing they were like, we got to retain one silly thing. 
and the mayonnaise is the thing that, that they retain. And that turns that. into the rules debate, oddly enough. The one thing yeah. they get a little loose on that actually does turn, apparently, the long-running uh, the, the long rules debate is the one thing that you thought was just entertaining. My group, uh, my Sunday group, actually has an alchemist jug, okay. and there's a lot of um, uh, debate over who gets to uh, ha have ownership of the jug. Uh, we've got one character who's a uh, rogue assassin, and so, of course, he really wants to... If right. you're, Producing poison because he wants to. Okay, that's, one of, the, that's one of the substances. One of the substances that, that okay. can produce yeah. a small amount of poison. Well, that's. Uh, it sounds perfect for, for right. an, an assassin. Uh, we have another character who's a fighter and uh, sort of role plays as this very uh, ostentatious, lordly character, right. always very impressed with his uh, noble lineage. Right. Um, and he wants it. Uh, he wants it just for uh, so that he can have wine whenever he wants wine. Okay, uh, so that's something that doesn't have a whole a huge amount of in-game effect. That's just no. They're talking playing flavor. You're talking about a player who yeah. also is very proud of his uh, cape of billowing, uh, which, uh, as uh, in case you don't know, I, cape of billowing is a magic item. It's a cape that uh, the only ability it gives you is as a bonus action, you can cause it to billow majestically. Yeah. <clears throat> what does that do? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually in the book. It's in the book. Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is there a lot of stuff like that in Fifth Edition? There's, there's like, not, just... I wouldn't say a lot, but there's yeah? definitely some. Really? There's definitely some, yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Uh, so far, he's won the argument. He's carrying around the jug so that he can uh, really? have, have some wine whenever he wants Really? Uh, you know, we have... Um, wow. Uh, as you know, magic item distribution can get pretty heated. Um, yeah. So we've actually shortcut that by having a go-to rule, which is we dice for it. So at the moment it becomes contentious yeah. at all, dice yeah. come out and we dice okay. for it. Okay. Interesting. Uh, and, and he won the roll. Interesting. The first time, like, I hadn't seen that until we played in the Bill Webb game, actually, where that was just the way every single time, right? I think every single magic item that came up, just people rolled a number of dice scoring their level, I think. Mm. Am I right? Maybe I'm thinking first edition player's handbook says that. Um, and it was, it was news to me of, like, like, like dice it out, because to me it seems like suboptimal team behavior, if I'm not crazy. So William points out that uh, mayonnaise was invented in the 16th century and is therefore anachronistic to include in D&D. Nice point. Nice point. So major error. Excellent. See, this so, is why I normally don't run 5th edition. So here's, so here's my question, then. What is the time period of Dungeons & Dragons? What year is it set in? 1300s. 1357. <laughs> <laughs> that's very specific. You thought of this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is, I think that's a choice. I think that's a choice that well, players sure, can yeah. can choose for themselves. Yeah. Uh, look at a game like Lamentations yeah. of the Flame Princess, where it's right. a far more Renaissance period, and I would say True. more likely True. that game is sixteen, seventeen hundred, maybe. True. Right? Do you have yeah. pirate ships? Do your pirate ships have cannons? That's also much right. more uh, further in the future. Right. I think True. that's a thing the DM has to establish, and then you're going to have to make rulings. Um, you know, I, I wrote a, a blog piece right. about tools, right. right? And I had a challenge, a player challenged me with um, wanting to buy a drill, right. a hand drill, so that you could right. drill holes in, in doors and peek through them to see the monsters on the other side. And then I went, started thinking, well, when, yeah. when were drills invented? Yep. When yep. Were, modern drill yep. bits didn't come until the yep. 1800s. Yep. So, yep. yes, there were drills during the Middle, the, right. the, uh, middle Ages, but they're right. really primitive compared to what we're used to. Gotcha, gotcha. And I've had to have the same discussion about like pulleys. I've had players wanted to use yep. a pulley to pull something up, and I and at the in the game I made the wrong call. I said no pulleys aren't available, and the research later on was that yes, they actually would be available. In fact, you can see them in in medieval pictures of castle construction of hauling up blocks of granite with with a bunch of pulleys. Actually, I mean, so. you know, one might point out that in 1357 there was no tinning. No, no one had invented uh, iron rations. Except for the dwarves, <laughs> exactly. There That's you go. what I'm saying. Now, I your, agree. So no your humans, out, right? right. Yeah. No humums have, but dwarves have special metallurgy so that's, technology. That's a really interesting way of, of handling that kind yeah. of problem, right? Is to say that, well, maybe certain cultures that are right. pure fantasy right. could have invented some of these things. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And I think that's that's common also like a lot of games say uh, you know the only the only people that have cannons are dwarves maybe. That's right. I think that's kind of right. a common Well, also once you get into fantasy realms you right. can start saying like okay, yes, well my pirate ships don't have cannons, but they have right. wizards who cast fireball, right? Correct. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. And you know, so obvious so so it's interesting that like a lot of people, you know, say that, you know, some people would argue nowadays that D&D doesn't actually have any particular real world analog. But the, the original Little Brown books actually do say, do, you know, th this is a medieval-oriented uh, setting, mm -hmm. and you should not expand to crazy other settings like the moon or science fiction until you have exhausted all of the possibilities in the medieval setting. 
Um, I feel like it's a taste choice, right? Like, um, yeah. I mean, look at Eberron, right? Right, right. And you get into a lot of sure. more, absolutely more higher levels of technology. You've got the lightning settings. railroads. If you're not familiar with Eberron stuff, yeah. like you've got the war forged. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I totally think yeah. this is this is a choice that one can make. And, yeah, and I'm fine with anybody making any choice. Yeah. I think the most important thing is that the DM discuss that with their players, right? Set expectations so that a well, player knows: Am I going to be able I to buy tinned saying. food? Am right. I going to be able to? Right. You know, right. get a hot air balloon, right. or is that something that doesn't exist in this? I world? mean, now can you be completely comprehensive and encyclopedia with it up front? Probably not. I mean, we we still get surprised. No, we but, still but, have to do research about whether a particular time period has certain technology or not. Yeah, but you can set a baseline. You can yeah. say it's 1357 years, yeah. or you yeah. know, it's Renaissance period Italy, yeah. or you know, yeah, loosely. definitely, definitely. I think I once challenged. I actually think I once, um, like in an online forum, I I politely asked uh, Gygax actually of. Your, the ship technology that you've got in original D and D, you have you have both, uh, you know, uh, 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 northern longship type uh, ships, and you also have cogs and uh, like naos and things like that. And those didn't exist at the same time. Are you are you comfortable with that? And he was he was comfortable with that. He was like, yeah, whatever. I didn't really pay attention to that so much. I mean, I think you played pretty fast in those yeah, tech levels, agree, right? Like, look at the whole oil I problem, agree. right? With, uh, right. Is that kerosene, right? And when, yes, when was kerosene? Right, exactly, invented? exactly, yeah. exactly. So, to bring it back to, to f- yeah, f- yeah. food a little bit, yeah. um, what do you... So, you know, we're, we're talking rations, um, you know, resources in the wilderness. What do your player characters... How do, you, how do your player characters normally feed themselves in town, and how do you handle that? Like some, like you just showed me a menu of specific mm. things in the tavern. Do you, in your normal games, do you expect your characters to go to the tavern and price out what meal they're having? No, generally or, not. Yeah. Um, you know, that's. The, I mean, I feel like it. It probably depends on what the concept of the game is, right? In right. that game, it's getting together at a tavern, having a meal is all very much part of the plot right, of the game, right. right? So, so it's a feature of that particular game. I would say in a normal campaign. I usually abstract it a bit more. I might boil it down to just a daily cost of living. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so this many silver pieces yeah. per day is going to get you your your room and board and you know food for the day and etc. Is that a choice that the players are making about like what level to like? I think I've seen some rules where the the players are going to make a choice about am I living a bare bones lifestyle or mm-hmm. like a normal merchant lifestyle or like a high class noble lifestyle with. Maybe different advantages, disadvantages to those cost points. It depends if the players want to dig into that or not. I think. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So some players like that's just tedious, and they just want to get back and go fight right. monsters in the dungeon. Right. So we just flat fee off you go. Right. You know, in other cases, it's more interesting, and I might even vary it based on location. Right? How yeah. nice of okay. a town are you okay. in right now? Yeah. Is this available? Yeah. Um, certainly, anytime my players start getting into that realm of I want really nice food, I want really nice accommodations, I want really right. nice clothing, whatever, right. I say, well then. You, you tell me how much you want to spend. Okay. Okay. Right? Because, uh, you know, the world's your oyster. If you've right. got money to burn, right. Right. someone's going to sell you right. Some, right. Okay. something right. to fit that budget. <laughs> so. right. Now, uh, interesting. See, an original, like, like zeroth edition, first edition, that actually wasn't a choice. Hmm. Is it's actually based on level, right? There's an upkeep cost that you're requi- everybody's required to pay. You don't have a decision about it, and it just increases based on your level or experience. So the presumption... Uh, the core presumption in D&D is that kind of like, you know, Fafford, Grey Mouser, Elric type, I mean, they're inherently uh, not terribly wise with their money and inter- inherently free spending. Uh, and as they as they go higher up in level, they're actually just paying more and more money for presumably higher quality food, beverages. They're drinking a lot, uh, buying, you know, fancy wines and things like that. And so that's another thing sometimes surprises my players about, like, why are you charging us more and more and more money over time? And I'm like, you are not good with your money, and you are, but you are ha- you're having to import better and better wines from further and further uh, distant lands in order to satisfy your increasing hunger and thirst. Um, honestly, this is, this is where I get into more gamified systems where I want to do carousing, right? The players are that is what carousing is right carousing is having a good time uh, spending way too much money on food on lodging on entertainment on whatever (laughs) right right the whole point is like we just brought all this money with from back from the dungeon let's spend it and have a good time yeah the thing is okay so many many people love the carousing rules right everybody I play with usually loves carousing personally I don't use them the only the only problem that I have with it 
is that, you know, so obviously carousing rules, the main thing is you get extra experience and everybody's like really enthusiastic about it. But now when I read the literature, like when Fafford and Grey Mouser go out and have a, an enormous party and lose a whole bunch of gems, they're not happy about it at the end. They're very sad about it. Mm. They lost all this stuff that they had previously. So for me, I kind of want some mechanic that makes you sad, very sad, <laughs> instead of instead of happy about about losing all your. No, money. I've I've heard from some uh, other DMs who then use carousing as the sole means of gaining XP. Understood. Yeah. That Understood. only yeah. Uh, that yeah. that XP is tied to gold pieces, and it's only gold pieces spent, not gold pieces earned. Understood. Understood. <laughs> Um, it's it's a it's a it's a big reversal from standard D and D. Yeah. It's a big reversal where the, the, the you know the the challenge is go in the dungeon and get out treasure. That's how you get experience. So to me, it seems like a big reversal. Yeah. Um, well, the thing is, I think ultimately what you're balancing here is a is much more of a game system than a setting uh, element, which is mm -hmm. the primary motivator generally for players is XP. What do you tie that to? Sure. By tying it to a certain sure. activity, sure. you are encouraging that activity to happen sure. in your game. Sure. Right, so if it's killing monsters, right. then you're gonna have they're gonna have a bunch of you know right. murder hobos, and if it's uh, right. you know if it's spending money, then you're gonna have a bunch of partiers. But on the other hand, I find nowadays it seems like a lot of like maybe maybe younger people are are actually really revolting against the idea of experience points. Like a lot of people. Oh, now you have like stuff like fifth editions. Yeah. Um, uh, what do they call milestone based? Level. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess that's a whole maybe that's a whole different. That's a whole different yeah, episode whole of Wandering yeah, DMs, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. But actually, I mean, I'm, I'm personally grappling with the fairly large number of people who say, obviously, I don't want to deal with experience points at all. Obviously, I'm using milestone leveling and just announcing levels when I, when I feel like it. I mean, I don't know. It does yeah. uh, obviate a lot of uh, fiddly questions one has to answer, right? There's a lot less of things you have to decide when you just say, eh, everyone levels up when I say. We're done. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where, like, as DM, I don't trust myself a lot. I don't trust mm -hmm. myself a lot. So having the objective points um, makes it concrete and objective in a way that I can't cheat it or make a bad decision that I'm going to regret later. I mean, also, I would say it removes that element of a player motivator. Right. Right. Since we yes, just know exactly. you're going to level up whenever you feel right. like, what am I supposed to do? Right. What are my goals? I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. So, uh, get a couple minutes more before the uh, the cookie is supposed to come out of the oven. I guess I'm going to check in here. So, but, so sometimes uh, people, ooh, they look pretty good actually. Um, so sometimes uh, people, let's go back yeah, where yeah, we yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, I was um, going to show you that you can turn on the oven like that. Oh, you want oh, to take even better. Um, so sometimes people are in the wilderness and they've run out of they've run out of food and now they are going to have to sustain themselves on monsters. Mm. How much how much does a monster sustain your players in the wilderness excellent question I know. depends on the monster i suppose what monsters are edible what monsters are inedible <laughs> uh we had a game uh in our uh, uh in our july live play game right. where you guys found a pot of cream of halfling soup right well that's Which, clearly edible, right? <laughs> Delicious. That's clearly edible. I mean, we didn't have it. That was the, 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 the monsters. Og yeah, the ogres had it there. Right. And, and it wasn't clearly labeled. So Right. The mon but the monsters know what they're cooking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Delicious, delicious half -life. Great, great. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, most I think most, a lot of stuff, I guess I've heard people being tricked with uh, like like gelatinous cube gelatin. <laughs> like have, right, uh, and I think, and actually, there is actually there is a Gygax adventure where um, you can get served a uh, 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 black pudding pie or something like that. Right, Excellent. there's a there's a bowl of pudding on the table, but yep. it's a black pudding, yep. Yep. which is one of the worst monsters ever. Um, so not everything, but I tend to be. I think I'm giving like you know every hit die is like I don't know three three people days or something like that is what I'm doing these days. I would usually assume most most times when my players try to. Um, get any resource off of killing a monster, whether right. we're going to skin the tide right. or we're going to, you know, cook its meat or right. what have you. That, like, at most, is something that's going to help you right then that day. There's nothing okay. that you're going to pack yeah. away, okay. right? Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty harsh on that. Like, even like, right. like the, like, oh, I'm going to skin it. I'm going right. to, you know, skin this creature and, and take its hide. And right. like, well, are you going to, like, actually tan the hide? Or are you right. going to carry around a rotting skin for three weeks and forget that it's there? Right. And then try and pull it out in town and be like, look, right. I got this alligator hide. No, you don't. You have a rotten mess. Agree. <laughs> Agree. Yeah. It's a, it's a, and that makes a lot of sense, obviously. Yeah. Again, without refrigeration or you know, cooler, cold and coolers or something like that. So I think for me, it's like you can kill the monster, you can eat it that day and it's going to yeah. sustain you for like yeah. a week. Yes, yeah. basically the idea, right? Yeah. Wait, so you can not... eat it that day and that's going to sustain you for a full week? 
Yeah, it's a big I, meal. Oh, well, okay, well, okay. Now we're debating. So what's what like like what's your rule for starvation? Oh, that's excellent. Um, I actually don't have a standard one. I'd have to I'd have to sit down and and I mean it depends on what system I'm in and right. et cetera, et cetera. Let's, let's say old but, school DMing. Let's um, say first edition DMing. Yeah, I don't I don't have one. You're you're forcing me to make one up on the spot. Make one up. I'm 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 run out of food in the wilderness Great. and I'm days away Great. from town. See, so you can probably go three days with no effect. Uh, then I would give you maybe another three or four days of, of penalties. Okay. Um, and then I would start maybe taking hit points. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, I, and I think that's similar to what I did in the past. I think I've, I've simplified it so it's just 1d6 hit points per week. There you go. That's it. Okay. Right. So, so for me, it's like, I, did you lose hit points that week or not? Right. That's that's what I'm dealing with, and therefore that's that's right. So it is. I think we're about 30 minutes that we've had uh, the wandering DMs white gold cookies in the oven. So I'm gonna pull. Uh, I'm gonna start pulling them out here and putting them on the cooling rack. Can't wait. That. See that? Oh, that was very Turn nice. Cookies, pretty very good. Nice. You happy with that size there? Yeah. yeah. Great. Can I eat them right now? I think you probably want to cool them like just a minute, right? Am I crazy? You can try it. Tell me if it's too hot. They're your cookies. <laughs> What's your kitchen? <laughs> uh, the tray's hot. Yeah, this is something my wife and I vastly disagree on. I I like them piping hot out of the Really? Oven. Okay, well then go she ahead. If that's to, to cool. Okay. Go ahead. Tell me what you think. White chocolate. That's a buy. <laughs> I like the giblets. Very tasty. Everybody likes giblets. Mm, that's a nice cookie. Awesome. That's excellent. So we should probably, I think that uh, when this, uh, later on, we'll have the recipe for this in the, uh, in the notes. The pan there on top of the Sorry, yeah, yeah, good point. It's just so incredibly hot. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to put the recipe right in the comments. I'll put the, the recipe video. in Excellent. the notes Excellent. on the video, right, so people Excellent. can look that up. Um, great. Uh, if anyone else has recipes that are specific to role-playing or use cases of food in their game, I would love to hear about it. I mean, I've only like only come up with those, those handful of Cthulhu games where, um, where I was able to use food as a prop. Right. I'm really curious if other folks have used food integrated into the game in some way i hadn't thought about that myself that would be that i can i mean if i if you put a cheese plate in front of me like in your stilton game i would not be able to avoid eating it myself i would yeah. be immediately consuming that so particularly as like a trick or a puzzle or something like that that sounds like a really excellent choice it's fun i mean in in that type of game too usually the players are playing into right they're they're there for mm -hmm. to watch their characters make bad choices and 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 befall terrible fates mm -hmm. Right, as as uh, that's my goal anyway in Cthulhu. So, um, you know, usually once that comes up, and they go, "Great, I get cheese," and does something terrible to my character. <laughs> Even better, <laughs> give me the cheese. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think this came out really well, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't know how it was going to work live, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it did work well. I think that the uh, the large number of monsters that I had to that I had to destroy to get the ingredients was well worth well worth this treasurable cookie at the end delicious <laughs> quite nice awesome hmm. all right um is that anything else are we no, missing, no. missing anything any final thoughts on uh food in role-playing games i like you know an old school resource based game and i like it being gritty and i like it being you know a bunch of things are being concrete that a player can sit down at the table and know what we're talking about not even knowing any special D, &D rules so i actually do kind of like a game where you are talking about poles and swords and torches and food um, and something that you can immediately grip onto as being, you know, possibly threatening or something you really need. So I actually do mm -hmm. still like having, you know, resource-based stuff around food in my game. And I think everybody yeah. can understand that. It's funny, um, as you challenge me to come up with what are my rules for starving, the fact is, even though I agree with you and I like to have rules for deprivation and what happens when mm -hmm. you don't have that stuff, I'd say that in pretty much every game I've ever run, my players are so worried about that not happening that yeah. it doesn't, right? That they are always prepared or they are always right. getting out of there or, or, or right. abandoning all of their plans to solve right. the food problem right. before it really becomes a problem. Well, that's an interesting point. See, and, and like I say, with my current play group, it happened once. Yeah. Right? It happened once that they got in trouble 
that the, the newer players weren't aware that, that might be an issue. And it, and it hasn't happened yet. But it hasn't happened after that. They've all been really, really, really careful to always buy those rations before they leave out. So it is interesting. It only happened really once. Hmm. And then based on player initiative, they're, they're always taking care of it. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Yeah, so uh, send us your recipes or send us your ideas for using uh, food and games. Uh, and tell us if you want to see more cooking versions of Wandering DMs in the future here in Paul's Kitchen. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the, the, apron, uh, the apron cosplay from, uh, from Isola Garbani. We do appreciate it. I would like to take yes. a moment right. um, to highlight uh, the work of uh, a, dear, a dear friend of ours uh, who unfortunately recently passed away, B.J. Johnson. Um, we've played a lot of games with BJ. Uh, he's written a lot of his settings up, which can be found on Drive Through RPG uh, under Big Fella Games. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of those. This is a Thousand Year Sandglass. It's an Arabian kind of setting, Arabian Nights kind of setting yep. for, for uh, Labyrinth Lord. Yep. Uh, that's generally, I think, the yep. Labyrinth Lord is what he wrote for. Uh, brilliant artist, uh, great game designer. Uh, we miss him incredibly. And um, so if you, if you want to check out his work, uh, you can find it on Drive Through RPG. You should do that. It's really it's a, a wonderful illustrator, wonderful artist, wonderful game designer, and uh, Paul is correct. We all miss him very much. So you should check it out. You should check out what we have gotten to enjoy for many years at uh, Big Fella Games on uh, Drive Through RPG. Yeah, and, uh, presumably uh, any further proceeds that come from that would go to his family. Or I something think yes, like exactly. Movie, so right. Um, yeah, please do check it out. Right. Um, yeah, that's, I think that about wraps us up for, the, for today. What can we look forward to next week, Paul? Um, next week we'll be back to having special guests. Uh, uh, special guest Emma Lambert will be with us. Uh, she is the comms director for uh, the show Web WebDMs, oh. uh, another excellent show of uh, advice, uh, DMing advice on, on the internet. Um, and there's be, more than one? And there's um, no. Shocking. Right? Really? Okay, all right. Well, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so she'll be coming on uh, to discuss with us uh, how to make the most out of your convention. Oh, oh, I need that actually. Yeah, yeah I totally. We'll, that's actually something I don't do super well with. So I actually, I, I need that advice. Yeah. So we'll be looking forward to speaking with Emma. Yeah. Next week. Great. Great. Um, uh, right. Is that? That's, is that how that works? Yep. Great. Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So everybody, remember, you can uh, like, follow, and subscribe to us on uh, YouTube and Twitter and Twitch under the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites. So please look for us there. Yes. And uh, our, uh, our show is also available in audio-only podcast format. You can find that at wanderingdms.com or any of the common podcast carriers such as Google Podcasts or iTunes or Spotify, etc. Uh, if you are listening to this show on one of those sites, please take a moment to rate and review us. Uh, we really appreciate that. It helps us out a lot. It does. And as always, thanks so much to uh, the contributing patrons uh, that we have that support and make the show better uh, than it possibly would be without us, uh, without them. Uh, if you'd like to join them, please do look us up on patreon.com slash wandering DMs. Uh, and we really do appreciate your support. As always, we are weekly at 1 p.m. Eastern time on Sundays. Uh, we'll be back next week with a new guest uh, and for more thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.